Yeah. Here, Tess. Come on. Come on. Come on. She just does. Uh, loved it. <laughs> she she doesn't know about tipping over water. That's okay. Yeah. My notes are wrong. Never mind. No, no. <laughs> Jim, could you talk a little about your grandfather and grandmother and how they left Europe and oh, where did oh. they come from? Well, it's a mystery on one side because people don't keep track very well, you know, amongst these are fairly poor people and they don't interested in genealogy like royalty you know knows who farted in 1322 you know oh deborah she farted and died in 1932 they keep track but my grandfather uh on the swedish side he came over here he wanted to be a cowboy in the 1880s you know strange idea yeah yeah well everybody from sweden you know they come over and instead He became a farmer. In Michigan? Yeah, but it's strange. He was out west when he was 16, before Wounded Knee even, you know. And he died very old. He was 90, and my grandmother was 97. They could speak Swedish, too, you know. And uh, then on my father's side, they were farmers. And this story is... Uh, My father's great-grandfather, he fought in the Civil War, and then he wa walked up to uh, Michigan and had a farm, too. So there are farmers on both sides, you know. And not very prosperous farmers, you know. My one grandfather never even had a tractor. He just had horses, you know. And they didn't have an indoor bathroom until 1956, you know. And that's where I got the background for farmer, from my mother's family. You know. And my dad was the first one to finally go to college. He went to study agriculture at Michigan State, where I eventually went to, you know, mm -hmm. studying cattle, yeah. you know. And you were living in this area, or...? Down south. No, I was living, we, I grew up mostly in Reed City. I was born in Grayling, which is way up north. And then when, early in high school, we moved down to East Lansing because there are five children. And he wanted us to all be able to go to college, but he had no money to send us. So we could live at home and go to the college down the road. That was the idea of moving down there because he didn't want to move down there either. Finally, yeah. you know. I was struck by, while translating your books or reading them, I was struck by the importance of nature as a place where <clears throat> many change, changes can happen or at a place where you can heal your wounds, you know. Uh-huh. Well, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, I think I'm always struck often in the mountains the people become smaller and more vicious and petty. You know, it won't do it unless you can't get more out of nature than you bring to it. It's just like New Age people trying to get Indian secrets all the time. You know, trying to steal the secrets. You can't steal the secrets from the like natural world. Yeah, you have to earn them, okay? So you can't get from nature or another culture, like Indians, something that you haven't earned in your own heart. You have to earn it, and then you recognize it, okay, from the hearts. You know how Keats said, the, oh, I talked about the truth of the imagination and the heart's affections. It's caused by yearning. So if you look at nature, you forget yourself, and then you can merge with her or draw her to yourself. The same way with animals and the same way with Indian culture. You can't go in there and, and be a thief them. like the New Agers are always mocking or making parodies of Indian custom. What they call Indian. There's no such thing. There are hundreds of different tribes, you know, Pawnee, Shawnee, Paiute, Ute, Anishinaabe. You know, they don't, they're not Indians. What is this Indian mm -hmm. thing? 
for different peoples, you know. So that's, that's true. So uh, I suppose what it does, it dissolves your personality. You get out of yourself, or what you thought was your personality, which is never a very interesting thing anyway. Personalities belong to civilizations where you have to keep generating your personality every day in order to exist. But it's not very interesting in the natural world. You let it disappear slowly. No. Her personality is involved with vanity, trying to maintain an identity in a world where everybody is going crazy. You know, but you don't need that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. what's the sense of walking in the natural world and thinking about yourself? And you just become blind. You may as well be blindfolded because yeah. you don't see anything. That's why you don't like to go to New York or to LA. Well, I don't mind it once in a while, you know, just if it's not too long. Because, see, part of this process is to open yourself for the best part of New York or L.A. For instance, the more I spent in the natural world, the more I liked Mozart, or the more I liked uh, Shakespeare, you know, or Stravinsky, because it opens you up. Now you're listening better. You're hearing what they say to you. So it's just unburdening. You don't lose your aesthetic sense, because I basically write for aesthetic reasons, you know, you know. Uh, for instance, a serious novel full of good intentions. I can't read it unless it's written beautifully. I don't care. You know, if you want philosophy in that sense, go to philosophers. Mm -hmm. You know, the exception being in people like Dostoevsky, who just overwhelm you finally with every kind of content, craziness, you know, philosophy, politics, you know. Bella was good that way in America. You know, he he does everything at once, mm -hmm. very very subtly. You know, but so that opens your eyes. You don't become primitive because the most sophisticated people, in that sense, are the most primitive because they release their yeah. energy. Yeah. You know, like Picasso or Matisse. You know, they're very basic people, but had to, but, you know an enormously profound aesthetic sense, you know. You don't, uh, you know, develop that kind of aesthetic sense, though necessarily hanging around a university. You have to do it by yourself. What was the sentence you were talking about? Uh, little pork in a grocery is better than... Oh, oh that's odd and that's very fun. Yeah. <laughs> he says... He says, the cheap grocery port is better than the distilled water of the university, you know. It's just anything that speaks of life. And that's not to blame the university, which as Doug described, it's a wonderful sentence. Stanton said, uh, the university is a velvet zoo. It's a very comfortable zoo. Velvet zoo. A velvet zoo, a soft velvet zoo, you know. So I don't know my option. I couldn't teach. I tried to one year, but temperamentally, I wasn't suited for it, you know. I enjoyed all the intelligent people in that Stony Brook at that time. You know that Philip Roth was there, Alfred Kaysen, there, Lewis Simpson, there are many intelligent people, but I didn't feel at home there. Mm -hmm. You know, partly because it was on Long Island. You know? Yeah, and you wrote somewhere that you missed nature. At well, time. yeah, the because... Place where all the, your emotions were. Yeah, my wife kept dreaming of, uh, you know, the asteroid would hit, there would be an atomic attack, we couldn't get off Long Island, she'd dream of ra burning railroad cars full of dead sheep and so on. And I said, thinking, maybe we have it, we better get out of here. Go back home. Yeah, yeah, go back home. But it was very thriving. You know, when people are young is when they should spend a lot of time in cities, too, to know everything that life has to offer, you know. You know, 
And in America, in... there's some beautiful cities. So you must sometimes go to Seattle. It's an intriguing city. Seattle is like San Francisco was in 1958 when I was first in San Francisco. You know? It's a beautiful, interesting city. Minneapolis is a fascinating Chicago. But sometimes when you go to New York or L.A., the two places, that's where they issue the checks, you know. To make a living, it's too, too much if you're there for more than a week, you know. I don't get my naps, and the naps are central to my, my existence. Two naps a day to start over again. I'm best at sleeping, you know. I've developed this genius for sleeping all my life. And Henry Miller said, don't just take a nap, take a full dress nap, take off all your clothes, get under the sheets, put a pillow under your head and a pillow over your eyes and just snooze. And then a half an hour later you wake up and it's a new world again. And then you wear it out and you go back to bed, right? Do you have a special discipline for writing, or do you have some places in which you like to write, or different times of day? Well, no discipline. No discipline. Yeah. Discipline is an ugly <laughs> word. Uh, I write because uh, I'm a writer. I wanted to be an artist. So when I started at 16, discipline is a false word, because uh, that means you're making yourself. Whereas when I have something to write, I work sometimes three different periods a day, morning, afternoon, late at night, you know, when I have my energy back together. And then when I, uh, I'm done, then I just go do something else, you know. So discipline is maybe only what you need earlier, you know, because later it just becomes, it's your entire life. It's too late to become a cowboy or a fireman. So I never think about discipline. René Char said the best one, you know, that French poet. He said, you have to be there when the bread comes fresh from the oven. That's, that's it. You have to be ready, you know. Yeah, Char. And then Wang Wei, old Chinaman, said a beautiful thing. He says, who knows, who knows what causes the opening or closing of the door? He's talking about writing poetry. You never, but you have to be there, and you have to. Discipline is involved in learning skills, like Stevenson, Wallace Stevenson. Technique is the proof of your seriousness. So you learn, and then you throw away the concept of discipline, because maybe discipline, in that terms, would make you write too much. Isn't it a little like Zen when you are practicing Zen and you do it at first maybe one hour a day and after a little time you realize that this one hour a day is in fact your whole day. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Well, that's true because the whole point, uh, the whole point in meditation or whatever you want to call it, because as Snyder points out, it was a profound sentence, it's, a, it's really a savage attitude. It started early with hunters and fishermen, probably three, 4,000 years ago in China. I just read a wonderful book in Chinese terms. So you sit there for hours until you become horde, part of the service, this is the, the forest, and that's how you get game and so on like that. But so it's an attitude of total attention. Well, then people say, meditate, you know, in the morning or whatever. It's good. Just stillness. But then you want uh, that attitude to be the entire day. You can't separate it. It's just like people that go to church on Sunday and then swindle everybody on Monday, you know. All our SNL people, the $500 billion hoax, you know, we're all acted very religious, 
you know. I love God, I love America, you know, but then they would steal billions of dollars. Scum. They should lock them up forever. Yeah. Yeah. See, they give a black man that robs a grocery store 10 years. They give a white man who steals $10 billion one year. You know, it's unbelievable. <clears throat> Don't you think it's linked with this metaphor of the river, which is very present in all your books, you know, for instance, in Sun Dog? when Strang is swimming at night in the river, uh -huh. you know, and, I mean, there's a river just <clears throat> just in front of your camp yeah. right here. Well, I hear it all the time. and keep my window open. That's true. That, that particular metaphor is that you realize that your life is a river, and you're a river, and you can't, there's, you can't stop anything, you know. You're either, uh, let's say, you're either shrinking or expanding or something like the universe. So you're either, I hate that word, growing, but you're exfoliating or you're shrinking. But a river, you know, you can't stop a river. You can dam it temporarily, but it goes someplace. But what you do is try to form your life smoothly, smoothly like a river to get, keep flowing. So that metaphors everywhere in literature. Uh, Where else? Well, I mean, Proust and, or Thomas Wolfe of Time in the River, Thomas Mann, The Deep Well of the Past, the, the image of water, always, you know, you know. And so you study the river. I think I was talking to you, I read where in India, they would tie crazy people beside the river, and that would soothe them, you know. Yeah. Hillman said a great thing. He says, the concept that there is a light at the end of the tunnel is mostly a boon to pharmaceutical companies, you know. <laughs> so it's up to you to deal with it, yeah. to become the river without too many drugs, you know. You told me the other day that maybe when you felt a dam, you know, in front of your own river, or yeah. when you felt blocked or depressed, you yeah. were living some days doing everything backwards. Oh, that's talk a yeah, about that's an old thing, you know. You read uh, again since I was a boy because my father was interested too. Uh, we had a lot of books around about Native Americans, and I read finally after I was in college, that the Sioux, the Lakota, had this beautiful idea called Hayoka, where sometimes when you're really bored or crushed or whatever, to break through, uh, it's the same as then, to break through habituation and conditioning, to start doing everything backwards, you know. What does it mean? Well, you, you walk backwards morning, or, or, you know, you do, or you wake up in the morning, you have a little shot of whiskey and make dinner, you know, that kind of thing. Then you wander around. So you take your nightcap first. Yeah, no mm. responsibilities about everything. You do everything you haven't done before. Yeah. They have another marvelous thing that I tried once, but it scared me. Uh, they dig a hole. They dig a hole, and all they could see from the hole, you get down in the hole, is the sky. You know, it's the, the ring of vision or some sort, and that's, that's extremely right. troubling. So you dig a hole? Yeah, and you the sit down in the, the hole, hole. I've done it, and you just look up, and you just see a square of sky, and sometimes a bird comes across it, and you know, it's electric, you know. But you can do things, it's the, it doesn't matter if you use that, that whole concept has always been in culture. Like a friend of mine, Brian Walker, walked, or uh, uh, wrote a book about following his dog around all day, you know, to be, you know. But you're free, but sometimes 
when you're the most depressed, you can't, you can think of nothing. So if you have a few principles, i.e., uh, do everything backwards, do everything you've never done before, you know, jump in the river, climb a tree, you know. Now you are talking about Rimbaud. Yeah. You know, this dereglement. Yeah. Well, that was true. The you know, we were making it similar because when I went off to New York City when I was 18 to be a beatnik, you know, into San Francisco, I always carried Rambo, and I carried Rambo, Apollinaire, Dostoevsky, and Faulkner in the Bible. Well, what's the naturally, this is going to drive me crazy, right? You know, if I'm not crazy already to read just these men over and over again. But Rambo, I like that idea. You know, where he would say, even the vowels have color, A, blue, E, yellow, I, green, you know, that, as you say, de reglement de tout les sens. You derange your senses so you can perceive, to break, break out of the egg we're in sometimes. You know, it's the same thing. It's wanting more oxygen, more freedom, you know. We have a tremendous will toward freedom, and I often think this stress, they all now, the last two years, all they talk about in the newspapers and magazines is stress. <clears throat> I started to think partly where this must come from. The work's not any harder than it used to be. In fact, people used to work harder physically, okay? But so they work in the office like that, and they become more nervous. But then in the evening, rather than take a walk or sing, people used to sing a lot, you know, or go to the tavern and dance. They now only watch television, see. Well, how can television release your stress? All you see on television is more, more invent, in, invented stupidities and banalities. Are there some, <clears throat> some American contemporary writers that you care for? that you like to read or I don't know you know one reads one's friends always you know I sometimes feel that I'm missing out because I can't read fiction while I'm writing it but I read a lot of it you know I like Peter Matheson I like enormously Tom I always read I read Richard Ford but these are all my friends too you know I was reading whatever Styron writes, you know, of course, Saul Bellow. Uh, Hemingway or Faulkner? No, I, I, always, I always look at Faulkner. I never cared much for Hemingway, oddly. You know, some of them, early stories. I Nika Lamps? Yeah, Lamps. some of those, but even then, they were too tight, and I lived up here, and they weren't the world I knew. Too much in early in Hemingway, he cuts off the horse's legs to fit him someplace, you know. And temperamentally, I'm not attracted to that kind of thing. Farewell to Arms, and then some of his late work. As for, like, I love Islands in the Stream, and a lot of people don't care for it. They think this is very strong. It's more open. Where some of the things, like the sun also rises. I'm, not, I'm just not interested in those people, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. They're essentially sitting around whining, mm -hmm. you know, rich people sitting around whining. Mm -hmm. It's not interesting to me. Whereas Faulkner is always fascinating, you know. I suppose I'd revere Faulkner like I revere Melville and Whitman, you know. I think Faulkner's much the stronger artist, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And so, and also famous, so-called famous writers disappear, like Sinclair Lewis, on and on. You know, it's just not very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And you have a special love for Alain Fournier? Yeah, it's just that one book. I read it when I was 18, and it seems, Fournier seemed to me so uh, mysterious. You know, the man, he finds the house with this child. And then he goes away and he can't find a house again. It's longing, longing, yearning. It's the same thing. The real subject of Dalva is yearning, longing, you know. You know, because we're not alive very long. And it's all something just 
that you can't quite, something ineffable, ineffable that you can't quite reach or touch about life that fills us with this longing, you know. And I learned one thing, there was a letter I think I told you about, Elaine Fournier said, uh, you can only have the miraculous in your book if it's strictly enveloped, strictly surrounded by reality. Alain Fournier said that? Yeah, Alain Fournier said to, in a letter to Piggy or something like that. It's a, uh, it's a brilliant thing. John Fowles, the English novelist, found that quote in a letter. It's a marvelous notion. Where the South Americans are misunderstood by the critics because they think it's magic realism. But they haven't been to South America. They don't realize this is how people behave down there. You know, they're not always looking at their watch. You know. More oppression down there somehow causes more imagination. You think oppression is good for imagination? I don't know if it's good for it, but it can cause it, you know. It's the, it, I'm going to make a far reach that's senseless, but I almost think all great cuisines, for instance, like French and Chinese, come from economies of scarcity, you see. But you go to Kansas, right, where you have all the food in the world and there's no good cooking, because they don't have to use their imagination. It's very strange. I once ordered fish in a Kansas restaurant. It says fish, five ninety-five, and I says, "Well, what kind of fish is it?" And the waitress says, "It's just fish, fish." And I says, "Well, you know, in the ocean, she's very pretty, so I was trying to keep talking. In the ocean, there are many kinds of fish." She says, "But this is Kansas." We only have fish fish. It was wonderful. <laughs> like the big log, which is the name of big log. Oh, yeah, yeah, the big log. Or I came into this village, and I said, what do you call that big hill up there? He says, that's called the big hill. You know? <laughs> but I re read all, those, all that French fiction when I was younger. Everything. You know, from Stendhal, Flaubert. I still love to read Flaubert's notebooks or letters. They're so cranky, you know. About his trip to Egypt, there he was like Russell, a very bad boy <laughs> when he goes. To... Maxime Ducamp, yeah, his friend, yeah, yeah. And then my dad, like Guy de Maupassant, so I read all his stories, and then Rabelais, on and on and on. But mostly mm -hmm. the poets, mostly the poets, you know, because they would excuse your bad behavior. Say, Baudelaire, you know. I want to Jean, Jean Duval too, you know. He had one. Where's mine? You know that kind of thing. It's it's the craziness. Uh, Bruce Chatwin, I liked very well. He died last year. Fascinating writer, you know. I think in song lines, he was just reaching something new, you know, sort of autobiographical book that was taken when he died, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. You know, people navigating by poetry, you know, which we essentially do. I was thinking... The Drunk Boat by Rambo, you know. Yeah, I like that. No, no, the title, the yeah. English title. Bateau Il. Bateau Il. Yeah, but yeah, when there's whales rotting in the reeds and everything like that, yeah. I like that. And I like that line, and he says, I am lost in the amorous sadness of the night. That's an illumination, yeah. But then Henry Miller's wonderful book about Rambo, too, The Time of the Assassins. Henry Miller was always very valuable to me when I was... Uh, a young poet, because you're so distressed that you don't know what to do. And then you read Henry Miller. You gives know, you energy. Then, yeah, it gives you energy. He's like a blood transfusion, you know? Yeah. Like animals are now, you know. Like nature is now. Miller was the force of nature, you know. 
very extremely powerful extremely powerful writer you know, you know great wise crazy old man <laughs>